Good evening and welcome. On January 30th, Pope Fran on January 30th, Pope Francis received in private audience Notre Dame President John Jenkins, as well as members of his leadership team and members of the Board of Trustees. In his remarks, Pope Francis stated that it was essential for Catholic universities to offer, and I quote, uncompromising witness to the Church's moral teaching and the defense of her freedom. He continued, it is my hope that the University of Notre Dame will continue to offer an ambiguous testimony to this aspect of its foundational Catholic identity, especially in the face of efforts from whatever quarter to dilute that in indispensable witness. Tonight's forum is titled, The Pope Francis Challenge, Notre Dame and Catholic Identity, in which our panelists this evening will offer reflections on the present state of Notre Dame's Catholic identity and mission in light of the Holy Father's words. They will explore such topics as missionary discipleship, witness to the Church's moral teachings and support for the magisterium, defense of the Church's freedom, and witness to the foundational Catholic identity. Joining this evening are three distinguished members of the Notre Dame faculty. Patrick Deneen, political, political Science Department and Professor of Constitutional Law. Martin Kramers, Mendoza School of Business, Professor of Finance, and Gerald Bradley from Notre Dame School of Law. Our other panelist, Cardinal Sneed, or Carter Sneed, was, who was scheduled to join us, has taken ill and will not be able to participate. We are grateful that Professor Bradley could be with us this evening. We are also pleased to welcome Michael Bradley, editor of the Irish Rover, who will serve as moderator of this evening's panel discussion. Before we begin this evening's discussion, let us pause for a moment as we offer a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. God our Father, in your loving grace, we gather here tonight, and we do so with the awareness that without your divine presence, here and also within ourselves, our work will be empty. Give us union of heart and mind to consider the tasks set before us today. Send the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, to open our imaginations to any challenges. May we trust and share our convictions with enthusiasm. Sustain with your help, enable our efforts to further the mission of this university, which wells from the heart of the church. May we balance our present needs and aspirations with eternal values. We pray in a special way for our students who are taking their midterm, ex midterm exams and anxiously awaiting the beginning of spring break. May the break be filled with days of rest and renewal. We also pray for ourselves and ask for the extra layer of patience and a tad more energy to remain vital and charitable. Finally, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and Ukraine and other troubled spots throughout the world, whose sufferings continue long after the images of destruction on our TV screens cease. Grant them peace which, with justice. We ask all these things through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So folks, thanks for being with us here tonight. It's good to be here in an intimate environment in which we can talk about these things. With these three professors, one of whom uh, stepped into the box late in the game, so we're grateful, especially to Professor Bradley for being here, to all three of our presenters tonight. I'd like to ask Professor Kramers to sort of get the ball rolling here. The first topic that we're going to cover this evening, there's, a, there's quite a bit of overlap between these topics, but between them all, we'll be able to offer a pretty comprehensive view of Notre Dame's present, the present state of Notre Dame's mission statement in light of Pope Francis's remarks in January. So Professor Kramers, if you would, could you speak a bit to the aspect of missionary discipleship to which Notre Dame is called as a Catholic university in light of what the Pope said? And just get the ball rolling there. When the conversation will be fairly free-flowing tonight. We'll have more of a discussion going between our panelists. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, thanks for the opportunity to be on this panel. Um, let me preface by saying that I'm new to Notre Dame. Uh, it's a place where people tend to stay. Um, but I, I just joined uh, 18 months ago. Patrick and I actually joined, joined together. Um, I Not in the same recruiting office, though. <laughs> um, but I met Patrick through uh, the introduction at, at the university. And for me, coming to Notre Dame um, was very much uh, because of its Catholic mission. 
So I start going to Notre Dame as a tremendous opportunity to really try to integrate my faith and, and my profession. And I think Notre Dame is unique that it gives that opportunity to, to, to Catholic faculty. Um, and so, to, so the Pope issue issues a, a real challenge but that I see much more as an invitation. Um, it's a very personal invitation for me, and I think it's an invitation for, for all of us. Um, so today, Notre Dame uh, unveiled a new strategic plan, and um, the goal one in the strategic plan, and I commend the university very much for this, is I quote, goal one is ensure that our Catholic character informs all our values. And they quote, it is a ratio where Pope John, where Pope John Paul II wrote, "Science can purify religion from error and superstition. Religion can purify science from adultery and false absolutes. Each can draw the other into a wider world in which both can flourish." Neither social science. I'm in finance, um, but nonetheless, the challenge is there. And, and I, I came to Notre Dame to kind of pick up that invitation and try to um, try to. Uh, by the grace of God, to, to, to do that. I think there, there, when I think of missionary discipleship, I think there are three main challenges. The first is to actually understand the Catholic faith. I did not go to a Catholic high school. I did not go to a Catholic college. I did my PhD at NYU, at Stern School of Business. I was a faculty at Yale University for 10 years. And while I got tremendous academic training and experience, I knew fairly little about my faith until, kind of in grad school, I have to confess, I realized how thoroughly confused I was as a Catholic. And for the first time in my life, I really met people who were not at all confused and were much smarter than I was and could explain the Catholic faith well. And by the grace of God, I, I decided I wanted to learn, go back to the sacraments, go back to, uh, go back to the church. But it also, uh, for me, therefore, it was actually very hard to, to understand uh, faith. And then, so that's the first part, do we, actually, do we know our faith? I realized I didn't. And so since then, I've been trying to play catch up. Our academic training as professors doesn't prepare us very well right, for missionary discipleship uh, at the university, I think. At least mine did. Then the second thing, once we you know, are more educated in the faith. We have to try to integrate our faith with our profession. The broader academic uh, academy um, doesn't do that or doesn't welcome that. And then the third is to try to do so um, in a way that is real or realistic, that is also in communication with the world. But for this to be missionary, it has to engage in conversation with the world. So you have to talk about the Catholic social teachings, in my case of finance, but do so really in a conversation with the dominant modes of thinking about, my, in my field, business. And so all of these three aspects, I think, are a tremendous challenge. Again, first, to understand what the church is actually teaching about Catholic social teaching, uh, or the purpose of business and finance in my area. The second challenge is to uh, integrate that with my, own, my understanding of my field finance. And the third is to try to do so in a real conversation. And so I, I welcome this challenge. I think it's a terrific opportunity. Uh, but I also realize that this, this, is a, this is an invitation that, by God's grace, uh, I, I'm trying. But I do find it a great challenge. Professor Dineen, do you want to expand on your thoughts? Missionary discipleship? Sure. Well, I, as uh, Professor Kramer uh, just uh, mentioned, that uh, we were hired uh, at the same time about, about a year and a half ago. Uh, we met each other at, at the orientation, um, and uh, uh, so we're, I think we both feel ourselves in the position of uh, uh, relative uh, novelty here, uh, still trying to find where the water fountains are, the elevator shafts, etc. Um, but perhaps also bringing uh, the vision of a, somebody who's seen the place for, for, the, for the first time in some respects. Uh, I came here from uh, not from a secular university, but from a, a, another Catholic university, a Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., where I taught for seven years. Uh, and it was a difficult decision to leave Georgetown. I had tenure, I didn't have to leave. Um, um, we were, our family was well along there. Uh, 
years in school, etc. So to move our family uh, from the suburbs of Washington to here in Brighton, and sunny South Bend uh, was, a, was, was not an easy choice. Uh, but we had, we had really felt that in a lot of ways that our lives were disintegrated, disintegrated um, as, a, as a family in a sense that, that all of our life's activities as a family were chopped up. Um, schools didn't overlap with work, work didn't overlap with neighborhood, neighborhood didn't overlap with friendships, faculty, uh, um, very little interaction with other faculty. And if Catholicism, it seems to me, stands for anything, stands for many things. One of its fundamental things is certainly in a university, it's the idea of integration. Uh, the idea of integrating, uh, so here you are, so, uh, some of you I think are uh, uh, students living in Morrissey Manor, uh, and this, this event is organized in, in some part to bring together your life in the dormitories and the halls with, uh, with, with, with the academic life. Uh, in too many institutions that rarely happens, a thought given to how to integrate those parts of life. Uh, we think as faculty, we tend to think very little about how to integrate what it is our field is, what it is we teach or what it is we research, with what else is going on in the university. We're essentially hired generally, and this reflects the, what Professor Kramer said about the training, uh, that we're, we're hired as experts, as specialists, uh, with a real focus on achieving expertise in our particular area, in our particular field. And this tends to mean that faculty will often identify more with people in their own fields at other universities than with fellow faculty who they may be sharing office, uh, uh, um, office space within the same building. Uh, that you will often know far less about your colleagues than you will uh, about uh, people uh, who are beyond the gates of the university. So um, it seems to me that this, this idea or ideal of integration has to be central to what um, constitutes a Catholic uh, understanding of our lives, uh, both within the university and beyond the university. Now, Pope Francis' call for missionary discipleship, uh, it seems to me, uh, challenges Notre Dame in, in two distinct ways, and that can often be very difficult to balance. Discipleship means to be faithful to the teachings, uh, to, the, uh, to be faithful adherents as, as much as humanly possible, we're always going to fall short, but as much as humanly possible to the teachings of Christ and the Gospels mm -hmm. and the Church's uh, efforts over, over centuries to understand how that interacts and uh, um, continues in its unfolding in history. Uh, but missionary dimension means that that discipleship has to be engaged with the world. Um, and that it has to um, not simply be true in a sense to itself, but it has to also speak to a world that is sometimes highly mistrustful and often, indeed, as Christ would tell us time and time again, will often hate the teachings of the Gospels and will often regard it uh, with a great deal of distrust. So how does one balance these two calls that Pope Francis put together, missionary discipleship? Well, it seems to me that, uh, just as a beginning, and I think we'll continue talking about this, but, but as a beginning foray, Two things can't happen. A, um, Notre Dame can't simply conform to the world if it wants to be a disciple, if it wants to be true to the teachings of the gospel. I mean, uh, in, uh, uh, one of the letters of Paul, uh, which one, uh, he talks about the wisdom of the world um, being, in some ways, the, uh, the knowledge of fools, and that the, the, the belief of the church would often be seen as itself a kind of foolishness, but itself a kind of deeper wisdom. Uh, that there has to be a willingness from time to time, it may be in, a, in the times we're entering, Pope Francis talks about the change times of the 21st century, that the position of Notre Dame vis-a-vis -vis its discipleship will be very unpopular um, and will become increasingly criticized. Uh, and Notre Dame has to be willing, <coughs> as an institution, as, as a discipleship of the gospel to be at times unpopular in the world. But that doesn't mean, and here's a, the, the, uh, the other part of this, this doesn't mean a kind of withdrawal, uh, the, t the temptation to kind of withdraw. And I think there are some Catholic institutions that have become increasingly, that we're going to withdraw from the world, that we're going to define ourselves by a kind of distinct identity um, in opposition to the world. And I think the idea of this missionary discipleship means to be true to the gospel, but in a way that will remain engaged with the world, that 
to negotiate that's going to be very difficult. It'll require a lot of prudence and reflection uh, and a certain amount of uh, wiliness and caginess. Uh, uh, but, that's, uh, but I think that's the, the challenge that Pope Francis has laid down for us. Professors, you've both spoken already to the need to engage with the world as it is, with the need to engage with culture at large. Professor Bradley, your situation is here a bit different in that you've been here for over 20 years teaching and have you enjoy a broader perspective. Concerning how Notre Dame has done in that respect over the past couple of decades, could you speak to, from your own experience as a faculty, how, how Notre Dame has done in terms of syn synthesizing their missionary outreach to the world and to the culture on the one hand, and on the other hand, their fidelity to, to the magisterium, to the church's teachings? Well, thank you, Michael. I should say that um, this evening hasn't turned out the way I initially planned. <laughs> I understand things about six o'clock or so, Carter Sneed reported that he was ill to our congenial moderator here. So Michael Bradley took to his cell phone and uh, hit the contacts list, and uh, well, I popped up first under Dad. So I got the call and came in from Rolfs at about 6.25, and my wife Pam hands me the phone and says, Michael's on the phone, he has a question for you. So I had been planning on spending an evening kind of relaxing with my family, and I am. Uh, Michael Bradley is here, Pam Bradley is here, and Timmy Bradley is running the uh, camera over here. But I have been here for, well, 21 years and some months, or in plainer terms, we moved here when Michael Bradley was 10 months old, so I have the advantage of a longer experience with Notre Dame, but I think I'd like to orient my brief observations around um, Pope Francis' challenge and his use of the term missionary discipleship, which I think is quite provocative and interesting, and it is a great challenge because I don't think we often think of those terms, well, perhaps we don't think of those terms as joined together, this missionary discipleship, and it's not readily clear what that means when applied to an institution like Notre Dame. It's easier to see what that would mean for a person, both to be a missionary and to be a disciple, and perhaps with regard to each one of us, we can grasp better, or without too much trouble, what it means to be a missionary disciple. But what does it mean for an institution? Well, I think that, as many of you, maybe almost all of you know, many of Pope Francis's remarks, uh, lectures, talks, homilies, have been subject, I think, to legitimate differing interpretations, and I think in some cases have been actually subject to purposeful misinterpretation. But I think missionary discipleship um, has a rich term and has more than one meaning. Uh, but I think that if we look at it just as almost a, a call or a formal um, declaration, I think we could say that it's a very high calling. That he's calling Notre Dame, perhaps especially, uh, to a very high role, mission, vocation, or apostolate. And I want to emphasize that because it seems to me it's helpful to keep in mind this very high call. When we talk about what Notre Dame does well, what it, what it doesn't do very well, what it does poorly, what the shape of its Catholic character is, because it may be one tendency um, to think of Notre Dame's virtues by comparing it to other places which frankly are not doing very well at all. So that Notre Dame is doing pretty darn well because, well, it's not Georgetown. Sorry, Patrick. I'm here. <laughs> and, or it's not BC, or it's not some other school that is, is frankly, quite secularized. And Notre Dame is, is rightly not grouped with those schools, so we're doing pretty well compared to some other places. But of course, if we think about that way of thinking of ourselves and our own appropriation and attempts to live out the Catholic faith, we know that that's not, not the way it works, right? And then you become stiff necked. And you look at other people and say, well, I'm not like those people, I'm doing better than they are. So if we adopted that view, that way of thinking about Notre Dame, you know, comparing it to Georgetown or BC, uh, we'd be making a mistake, I think. Uh, the same mistake we'd make if we compare ourselves to, well, that person across the room, they don't seem to be quite as holy as me, or they seem to have troubles, or their family is troubled, and mine isn't. Um, so you have this kind of pharisaical temptation. Uh, we need to resist that at Notre Dame, because there's a great deal for us to be proud of here at Notre Dame. Um, and I think that we're not only not like Georgetown, not like BC, I think we're really unique in being a major research university, which not only takes its Catholic character seriously, but actually successfully pursues and cultivates a Catholic identity. 
Uh, and I don't mean to say this unqualifiedly. Uh, I could be missing one place. I doubt I'm missing more than one when I say that there is another major Catholic research university that's doing what Notre Dame is doing. But of course, with that achievement um, comes even greater responsibility. Those persons and those institutions which have the opportunity to witness profoundly to the Catholic faith, that opportunity provided by good fortune, uh, financial resources, talented people congregating there, well then that means that responsibility is so much the greater. So when we talk about Notre Dame's Catholic character, we really have to be mindful of the fact that although it may, there may be times when we should be critical, we're holding it to a very, very high standard indeed. And I think that's right, and I think that's most basically what Pope Francis had in mind. I saw, uh, I don't know if it was a film clip or a report in print of something Father Jenkins had said about his encounter in the private audience with Pope Francis. And Father Jenkins was rightly emphasizing, I think, that at least he, Father Jenkins, took the Pope to be up to a point or in some measure uh, congratulating or approving or endorsing what Notre Dame has been doing. Uh, but I think Father Jenkins well knows that that's just the beginning of the story. And there's a great deal that more needs to be done. And I think the last thing on this particular point I, I would like to say is to, is to move forward or just to develop what the Patrick Deneen said. I think there are many places that, not many, 20 or 25 um, Catholic institutions of higher learning which in my judgment are profoundly Catholic, faithfully Catholic. Um, these tend to be colleges, not research universities. Um, they tend to be smaller. At least half of them, I think, have adopted self-consciously a more or less sectarian model. Um, there's a lot to be said in favor of that. Um, there's a lot to be said in favor of colleges, that is liberal arts colleges. Research universities offer wonderful and irreplaceable opportunities, uh, but you lose something as you move away from a teaching colleague, say. But there are many institutions, let's say 10, uh, sectarian Catholic colleges, and they're wonderful in their way. And there are some other Catholic colleges that need to be more engaged with the culture, and they're doing a good job too. Uh, but for a research university to be both profoundly Catholic and intensely engaged with our surrounding culture, well that I think is you know, the pearl of great price. So what's happening here at Notre Dame, what Notre Dame can be, what Notre Dame is trying to be, um, is definitely important. I think not only to the success of Notre Dame or to the sort of eternal gratification of Father Soren, um, or any other kind of more internal or parochial sort of standard of success or measure of edification, I think it's profoundly important to American society and to the American church, indeed, um, how things go at Notre Dame. So just in case, now you've been warned that if I say something critical of Notre Dame later, you know that it's with this very, very high standard in mind, and also knowing or appreciating that I think there's so much at stake. And for a lot of folks here at Notre Dame, the question really is, can Notre Dame success move about its dual, its dual desire, if you will, to on the one hand, be an authentic and the flagship Catholic university on earth, and on the other hand, really flourish as a research university according to these various other metrics, a lot of people really wonder if those two goals are incommensurable. And it's a very live question here now. Professor Janine, do you want to offer some thoughts on that topic? In light of Pope Francis's call to the leaders of Notre Dame to remain unabashedly faithful to the church's moral teaching, to the magisterium, as you pointed out in your first remarks, there's a great amount of tension there. The world tends to hate the church's teachings in some areas. How is Notre Dame doing, sort of setting a foot, one foot in both worlds here? Is it possible? Can it be done? Uh, that is, that's the question uh, uh, in many respects. Uh, I think it's a, it's a challenge worth taking up. Um, to echo what the Professor Bradley said, uh, the, the kind of dominant models, you could say, uh, is there's a dominant model of the Catholic Liberal Arts College uh, in which one can be relatively more insulated from uh, the demands in particular, that correspond or that, that follow on a research university to conform uh, to a set of what are often secular standards for what constitutes excellence in higher education. And then the other model is that of the, is that the, the research university, which has a set of expectations and, and rankings and uh, um, various criteria by which uh, research productivity and uh, uh, the 
esteem and, and um, whether or not uh, one's uh, uh, publications and findings uh, comport with what is, what is deemed by the, the broader world to be uh, constitutes success on the standards or basis of, of, of a, sec a secular understanding of the research university. Notre Dame is really trying to do something very unique and very different. And, and that, along with some personal considerations, was the reason that, that I came here, was to be a part of something that it seems to me is worth trying. Uh, whether we succeed, I think, is, is going to be uh, 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 a very live and challenging question going forward. And, and this is, uh, the challenge, in many ways, comes down uh, to whether or not Notre Dame can be true to this understanding of discipleship without wholly conforming to the expectations and demands of what are the requirements that the secular world expects of the research university. So can it continue or will it attempt to more deeply integrate the various disciplines and ways of understanding together? A research university tends to be judged on the findings of specialists, the publication records of specialists who do not have to be in conversation with each other. To what extent can we excel as a place that integrates knowledge rather than disintegrates knowledge? To what extent can we be true to the discipleship of being a Catholic university that on the one hand respects this valuable, um, deeply valuable um, criteria of academic freedom, like one of the, the, the obviously the watchwords of the modern research university, but which is often invoked, um, it seems to me in many contexts, as um, a way to challenge or confront the very idea that there is a truth, that, that the invocation of academic freedom is often invoked not in the name of pursuing the truth with the presumption that there is a truth, but rather to defend the view that there is no truth and that the university and its commitment to academic freedom most centrally stands for a kind of deep commitment to relativism. Now, a Catholic university both has to defend the idea of academic freedom, but as Pope John Paul II declared in Ex Corte Ecclesiae, in the name of proclaiming the meaning of truth, is what he said. So can a Catholic university, a research university, both be a defender of academic freedom, but with a proper end or goal in mind, which is not whether or not there's truth or not, but proclaiming the meaning of truth. Uh, that's, a, that's, again, a model we don't... We don't see in the world necessarily. It's not evident to us what exactly that looks like. Um, so I think that, uh, that whether or not Notre Dame will be successful is ultimately being true to itself and not simply conforming to the model of the research university that exists in the world. It will have to be something unique and will have to be bold and willing to be distinctive. And that's a scary thing, to be alone and to be uh, to be identified as something different in the world. Uh, but I think that's a challenge uh, that many of us want Notre Dame uh, uh, to undertake and, and need to, uh, uh, in, under which to flourish. Professor Kramers, many of the students here could agree with me in saying that business students at Notre Dame can take a lot of flack for being business students. And the business, business degrees are at times ridiculed for being um, various things. <laughs> <laughs> As a newcomer, I don't want to disenfranchise you with respect to what I said here by some folks. This being the case, in light of today's gospel, I'm impelled to ask you, how is Notre Dame doing, when one thinks of cultivating a sense of missionary discipleship in the students, of course it begins with the faculty, who then are tasked, and called, tasked with and called to inculcate in the students a sense of missionary discipleship as they go forward as witnesses into the culture, after graduation, a culture that's increasingly hostile to the values that hopefully they're learning here at Notre Dame, a lot of attention is paid to how Notre Dame is doing insofar as it is instilling in its students healthy sexual values, if you might, if you will. A lot of attention is paid to the relationships in the dormitories. I'm sure during the question and answer session we'll receive some comments and questions about the HHS mandate and its relationship to, to things sexual. But in light of the reputation that the business school here has here, in light of the recent admissions policy that was developed concerning the business school, capping the amount of students who are allowed to enter into the business school on an annual basis, one question in my mind is, how is Notre Dame doing in business and elsewhere? As far as cultivating in its students a real sense of vocation, a sense of a proper orientation of certain values at the core of their lives as students, how is Notre Dame doing in that respect? Is it sending out into the world 
graduates who have the right prioritization of what's important? Can they sort of perspectivize God and Mammon, as today's gospel mentioned? Um, great question. No, today's gospel was very happy. Um, talks about the eye and the needle. Um, now, when I teach finance um, and try to do it in the light of Catholic social teaching, I try to make a clear distinction between the church's strong defense for private property versus the church's also um, strong admonition that the use of our wealth, the use of our talents, is not just up to us. Right? That God gives us these gifts and then they come with a responsibility and a, and a purpose that is, again, not just up, up to us. The universal destination of, of goods, the church also calls it, or the, the preferential option for the poor, that we, when we use our gifts, we have to use them in a, in a certain way. Um, as a newcomer, I don't want to dodge your question, but as a newcomer, it's not easy for me to answer it. Um, if the business school is so popular that the cap needs to be uh, installed, then we must be doing something right. Um, I'm very impressed by our students. The hardworking, the very, um, the very smart. I wish they would speak up in class a bit more. I regularly tell them, don't be shy. And, uh, but I'm new, and so I have to still kind of figure out how to, how to do that. Um, and so at the end, I think that we do emphasize at Mendoza that this is for the common good, that we should ask more of business. At the same time, um, I think there's also a great challenge. Um, and the great challenge is the, the great challenge, as I mentioned in my earlier remarks, is how many of the faculty, including myself, fully understand and appreciate the Catholic social teachings. Second, how many of us are trying to integrate that in our classrooms with what we're teaching in business? And then third, how many of us are trying to not only do that, but also do that in a way that engages the students, that makes it relevant, uh, and that is in, in real conversation with the dominant modes of thinking uh, in Wall Street and on Main Street. At the same time, I do think, I'm, I'm kind of hopeful that we can do that. Right? That's my experiment. Um, and we can do so both in a Catholic with a small C way and a Catholic with a capital C way. What I mean by that is Catholic with a small C, um, that you always start and end with human dignity or the, the great um, dignity of the human person. So what is a human person? As I tell my students, and this is, a, this is a kind of a refrain that I've mentioned several times every class, I think I drive them crazy by it. But if they remember one thing from a class, it's that human persons are rational, relational, and Free. At the same time, our rationality is bounded. Our relationality is incomplete in the sense we hurt each other and are hurt by others. And freedom means the freedom to be virtuous, to, 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 to be good, uh, rather than abuse our freedom uh, or license. And so, for, to really do that well, we need to cast out. And, and we need faith, love, and hope. And then we have to use our understanding of human nature, which is basically natural law, with the, with the small c, but we really need the capital C, I think, to really do so successfully. To do so in the light of our faith by God's grace. We have to do so in a relationship with, um, uh, with our Lord and Jesus Christ. Whether or not we do that successfully in the classroom, um, I think that's the great invitation of our quote. And my sense is that um, that a lot of people are trying to do that, but I do not think that's the majority. But it's really better to ask the students. So when I ask the students who are taking my class with Catholic social teaching in the name, uh, with six Latin names of acidicals in the syllabus, I try to be very clear what my class is about. And I'm also happy to say that last year and this year, my class is full. Uh, Quicker people signed up. So I was very uh, happy with that, of course. And students are really engaged. They actually read the articles, we have good discussions in class. Um, for most encyclical students do write-ups, and these are, um, again, these are very good. Um, but when I ask them, I think many of them will say that in most classes, they don't uh, get this integration. Um, and for all my students, all 36, except just a couple, 
uh, my class was the first time they read any encyclical in any class or in general in life. And so that, that worries me. Right? Um, and I'm not saying that every class should do this. But at the same time, uh, what the Pope is asking, and I'm quoting here from Pope Francis' uh, uh, address to the Notre Dame delegation, he says, the Catholic universities, by their very nature, are committed to demonstrating the harmony of faith and reason and the relevance of the Christian message for a full and authentically human life. Uncompromising witness of Catholic universities to the Church's moral teaching as authoritatively proclaimed by the magisterium of her pastors. And so at the very least, I would like all students at Notre Dame to come away from Notre Dame with a good understanding of what the Catholic Church is teaching in their particular uh, field of, of, of interest. So for Mendoza students, I'm very much hoping that all Mendoza students are leaving Mendoza with a good understanding of Catholic social teaching and how to integrate that. And I think that's a great challenge. And um, I, I'm hoping that Mendoza will, um, will pursue that uh, even more actively. Professor Gravis just raised the point of the importance of having a faculty that's predominantly Catholic not just in name only, but really committed to the mission of the university. I believe it was Father Malloy, and someone on the panel, please correct me if I'm mistaken here, in, 1980, in the 1980s when he, penned the current, when he penned the current mission statement, referred to the necessity of having a predominantly Catholic faculty as being, in an authentic way, the litmus test of Notre Dame's Catholicism. Now, I know that as recently as about 2010, and I pulled these numbers from the university's factbook, which it published online publicly until a few years ago, only 56% of tenure-track faculty are nominally Catholic at this point. And as anyone guess, what percentage of that 56, as you said, Professor, are really seeking to integrate within and without the classroom for their students as a reflection of their own faith, the cultivation of these sorts of values that, that the students should be receiving here at Notre Dame. Whereas many students can attest, whether it's through the deficiencies of the core curriculum at this point or for other reasons, that they're not receiving this sense, this sort of integrated education here. Professor Bradley, since you've been here, for a couple of decades now, although you teach in the law school, you have familiarity with the undergraduate school by virtue of having sent, at this point, six children through it. Um, can you speak to this and the professor to you as well? I mean, the number of Catholic faculty is in some ways alarming, and, and that may seem like an ironic statement given that I'm sitting here as one of four people, two of whom are very recently brought in Catholic faculty here who are doing wonderful things, but Professor Riley, can you speak to this dynamic a little bit, what you've seen here in the past couple of decades? Clarification: It's a tenure track faculty. I, I assume you actually mean ranking tenure, so people who are considered to be regular faculty. Is that, would that be your understanding as well? Yes. Yeah, so Fifty-six percent, all tenured and tenure track. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Well, I, I think I remember the mission statement to which you're referring, Michael. Um, was certainly promulgated during Father Malloy's time as president, but the predominant number, which seems to become the, the Local point or the term of art, the relevant term of art, can also be found in Exquisite Ecclesiae, Blessed um, John Paul II's Apostolic Exhortation on Catholic Universities, which was issued or promulgated in the Feast of the Assumption in 1990, uh, talked about the number of Catholic faculty not dipping below a majority. And there it is, um, it's not an infallible teaching, and it's, and it's J, uh, John Paul II talking. I happen to think that's too low. I think if you're at 50.1% or anything of that, anything close to that, I think you're already in trouble. My own judgment would be you need a substantial majority of faculty who are Catholic, uh, but not only Catholic, because I think that although having a, a large number of pious Catholics on a faculty is a great benefit in many ways to a university, um, the great opportunity costs associated with each one of those whose piety um, is the sort of uh, the outer boundary of their Catholicism in the classroom. That is to say, as Patrick and um, Professor Kramer said, both said, the, um, the key is the integration of sort of faith and reason, I wouldn't quite put it that way perhaps, or the harmony of faith and reason, but it seems to me that what you want in an intellectual apostolate of the sort that Notre Dame is, is precisely an intellectual integration. That is to say, you need persons who not only affirm Catholic truths uh, and have a kind of uh, affected in Catholic piety, what you need, I think, in each one who's going to be contributing on all cylinders, if you will, um, a very deep and abiding intellectual understanding of the faith. Now, again, I don't suggest for a moment 
that there's a competition between appropriating intellectual content of the faith and matters of piety or personal adhesion to the Lord. These are all aspects of faith. When you're talking about professors in a research university, then it's very important that they not only be pious and affirm the truths of the faith, but understand them and be themselves well-formed Catholic intellectuals. Because only then can the relevant work of integration possibly take place. So I put it a little bit differently. The, the kind of integration that we're talking about, at least in part, and I wish now to draw your attention to, is the integration that occurs whenever someone who really understands the content of Catholic faith, put it a little bit more prosaically, possesses a profoundly Catholic worldview, and then approaches a particular subject matter, whether it's physics or finance, political theory, romance literature, or law. When you have that kind of intellectual formation, and then a kind of ruthless and clear-headed engagement with the subject matter, then you're going to have an integration of Catholic faith with the subject matter. And that's really a wonderful thing to behold. I mean, there's really, in a sense, no way to know what that's going to look like until the work of integration has taken place. But it's precisely that an integration, an integration is the right word, not a combination, not a mixture or encounter, but a real unity, a synthesis of the two, the Catholic intellectual worldview and the subject matter at hand. And I'm reminded, just to give you an idea of what I mean when I say it's a wonderful thing to behold and it's unpredictable what it will look like, there's a remark which I'll paraphrase that was delivered in a homily by Cardinal George some years ago um, at a setting off campus, but I happened to be present and I heard him say this, and again, it's, it was roughly this. Um, Cardinal George said that we, uh, we had no way of knowing what a Catholic Nigerian would look like until the faith arrived in Nigeria and the faith took hold of some Nigerian people. And then we had Nigerian Catholics. But before the integration occurred, no one really could have predicted what that would look like. It's only now with the experience of seeing the integration, witnessing it, and getting to know some Catholic Nigerians, that we can give an account of what that looks like. So here, I think, is just a wonderful opportunity for creativity on the part of Catholic scholars. And I think, just to very briefly underline something Patrick referred to earlier, I think that here, you know, the Catholic University, the research university, Notre Dame University, really has to take a hard look at what it's really requiring its scholars to do. It seems to me that the premium has to be placed on precisely this kind of integration and successful integration of the sort I'm describing will have a very uneven relationship with the standards and metrics in that person's discipline. I'm not saying it's somehow the object of Catholic intellectual life to be at odds with everybody else. It's not the object of anything. Uh, it could be the effect in some cases. But we do have to understand that if we're looking for this kind of integration, then we have to expect that it'll be received unevenly and sometimes critically, sometimes warmly. Um, but it, that is the integration, has to be the thing that we're looking for. Because if we don't grow that, if we don't cultivate that, if we don't support that, well, that's not going to happen. Uh, as I say, the, the Catholic colleges are wonderful places, many of them, but they're not supporting faculty for the purpose of a research agenda. They're, they're teaching institutions. And at pretty much all the other Catholic universities, they're not that interested in the integration of which I speak. We've got about 10 minutes here before we'd like to begin questions and answers. So. If each of you, starting with you, Professor Kramers, could maybe speak just a bit to what you think is Notre Dame's, what you th which aspect of discipleship do you think is going, to, is going to be most challenging for Notre Dame to take up at this point? Uh, in what respects is Notre Dame really lacking in its apostolate? As a Catholic university, as a Catholic university that Notre Dame is. Um, so for me, um, it's been a tremendous blessing to be here. And one of the blessings is that there are so many people that I've met um, who are, are trying to do exactly what, what Professor Bradley was, was referring to. Um, one real privilege is to have uh, faithful Catholics across campus in various areas, in the business school and outside the business school, who are trying to do this. And for me, that is new. So I, I'm, I'm very excited about this, and I'm very um, eager to continue this, to try this integration. Um, but I think the challenge is to make this wider, right? to invite more people uh, into this, particularly in my area of business. Um, I 
think a lot of people think of business as just a technology. When I say just technology, it means it's value neutral. There's really not much moral content to it. And so, even if you are a Catholic, or no matter what faith you have, fine would look the same. Right? Um, and one of the things I was so excited to discover, that's, that's not at all true. And that was one of the reasons, of course, I wanted to be in Notre Dame. Um, there is a real distinct thing that we can offer the world, and it's very well articulated by the church in a long series of, of Catholic social teaching documents, starting with Vernon Varum, going to Caritas and Veritas. But what the church then does is propose kind of principles, this Catholic worldview. But the real integration, right, will, will then have to be done by us. Finance scholars or political science scholars or whatever the field is. Um, and I think we can really improve in, in encouraging, uh, but also helping faculty. I think, uh, um, I'm speaking for myself here, but I'm trying to figure out how to do this. Um, I'm very blessed that I, that I got to know a lot of faculty on campus that can help me with this. But we have to strengthen this community, we have to invite more people in. And, um, and I have to learn more about how to do this. Professor, did you have a question? Uh, well, you know, I think that when um, the outside world tends to tune in to debates at Notre Dame, it tends to be over highly controversial culture war issues relating to abortion, sexuality, contraceptive mandate, etc. Um, and th these are obviously extraordinarily important issues and topics, and these are going to have extraordinary, um, you to see um, issues like the mandate play themselves out, uh, extraordinarily important uh, uh, consequences for the, for the fate, uh, the capacity of this institution to live its mission, to be that missionary disciple. Um, but I think the overwhelming concern that I've come to have since arriving here just a year and a half ago is, um, and it relates I think to some of, the, some of the things we've been talking about here. Uh, is no, whether Notre Dame will have the courage in some ways and the, uh, sort of the internal coherence to be true to its best self and not to do the easy thing, which would be to conform to the standards of the world. Uh, and that's an easy thing to do because it's popular, uh, it gets you esteem, uh, it, it allows you to do things that you can brag about get the best students, right? um, uh, say that we're ranked X, right? top 20, um, our number one business school. I don't think that's based on its Catholic teachings. It's based on evaluations of students and uh, uh, corporations. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole set of metrics and measurements that are only going to become more uh, uh, governing. They're going to govern more of what higher education is going to uh, how it's going to be ordered. Um, some of you may have been following this, but the, but the Obama administration uh, is now uh, bringing, it's currently uh, developing, is, is, is about to bring online a set of um, metrics by which a, a, a college education would be regarded as having been successful. And one of these measures will be, it looks like, uh, the amount of money that students will earn after graduation, uh, which will mean that uh, students who may be drawn to professions of teaching, or the arts, or ministry, a whole range of professions that I would think are profoundly important uh, as, uh, for a good human society uh, and are, are, ought to be the object of our esteem, will become increasingly um, regarded as uh, undesirable by institutions who will be driven by this metric of what the income uh, is of their students when they graduate. Uh, so there's, there are tremendous pressures to conform to the demands of the world. Uh, the, the meetings today about mammon on and, and Sunday, about not, not serving two masters. Um, how we integrate the business school and the, the incredible pressure our students feel, both within themselves from the economic world and from their parents, uh, to be successful by the demands and measurements of the world temptation to market the Notre Dame degree as a credential uh, based upon its ranking and its position in our society. All of these things would be easy 
to do because it's the accepted and popular way to market and to, uh, and to organize yourself. So how will Notre Dame resist that temptation? How will it um, uh, organize itself in ways that it can offer to its students a first-rate, fantastic education which they can not only be disciples, but they can go out into the world and engage the world and be successful with the world, but not necessarily accept and conform to all of the world's understandings of what constitutes human success. Uh, this is what worries me most about Notre Dame. This is where I think our greatest challenge will lie going forward. I think we may do some wrong things in some of these other more controversial areas, but if we don't get this right, uh, then in the end I think we will have no chance with some of these areas where we think of ourselves as perhaps more controversially engaged with the world today. Well, returning to where we began um, with missionary discipleship, if you look at, well, I don't know for sure that you can look at any one of the three synoptic gospels, but perhaps you can, uh, to find where Jesus commissions the disciples and sends them out and gives them advice about how to operate as disciples of the Lord. And uh, the picture is not one that you would easily would easily put you in mind of Notre Dame. Um, that is to say, carry no bag, no tunic, no staff. Um, just go into the town and be supported by the local folks. Uh, and be ready to shake the dust of that town from your sandals uh, if they don't accept you and willing to hear your preaching. And I bring it up because in connection with Pope Francis's not declaration, but challenge to be an uncompromising witness, I think you can begin to appreciate, if I'm at all helpful at this point, um, that one needs to be nimble and detached and somehow indifferent um, to the principalities and powers if one is going to be a witness, uncompromising, if one is going to be a disciple, if one is going to be a missionary disciple. And I think that Notre Dame's greatest strengths or at least their most remarkable achievements, were actually here the source of my greatest worry. It means an enormous amount of money sunk into the campus. Enormous amounts of money have to be raised to keep it running and to make it what it's going to be for the next generation. Enormous numbers of people um, have kind of their careers, uh, for those of us who work here, those students, their career aspirations, we're intimately tied up with the society around us as it is. Um, the esteem of Notre Dame among other academics and other academic institutions, our acceptability to television advertisers, etc. All of these things make us, frankly, part of the establishment. And I think that the recent history of the Church of America suggests very strongly that this can be a real liability. It can be the millstone around our necks, right? We can see in so many respects how the desire of people in authority in the church over these last 10, 20 years, you know, to kind of hold on to the status the church had achieved, whether it's in some city where it took decades and generations of immigrants, you know, the, the widow's might all those years, to put together the structure and to acquire the reputation and esteem that the church has enjoyed. You can see church authorities acting in a becoming way to preserve that respectability, that place. And I don't think it's worked out so well, and indeed I think that we can see that there's a kind of reconfiguration or a reconception of the church's position in our society where it's a little more independent and able to act truly as a witness and as a disciple. And I do think that Notre Dame is in a situation where um, it could cultivate a more ascetical lifestyle, it could say no to the next $100 million, the next $200 million, and we'd be fine. Um, and I think that also the, um, the ways in which Notre Dame could, could cultivate, and I mean to, to make this point with some delicacy, cultivate more indifference to the world around it. Not for that sake, not for the purpose of being different or indifferent, but rather just so. It can see as doable and plausible and indeed desirable to give the sharp countercultural witness to our world that unfortunately I think our world is going to require of Notre Dame. Uh, but I think at this point the, the jury is out on whether Notre Dame is going to be that kind of lean, mean witnessing machine. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, please join me in thanking our speakers for their presentations and then we'll move on to questions and answers.
We'll have a solid half hour here to do this, so if you would, just raise your hand, uh, maybe stand up and announce your name, and then you can address your questions and wander to all of our panel. So we'll just begin right here. Hi, my name is Kenny Zesso. Um, I'm a sophomore economic major here, obviously, the other day. Um, my question is really quite simple. Um, what, what do you think about the campus crossroads project? And also, um, on kind of a, a deeper level, what if we're able to kind of overcome these challenges uh, will be the, the opportunity at the end of the road uh, that would await their day? Can everybody hear the question in the back? Maybe we'll, maybe we'll use my microphone for question asked uh, what, what do we think of the Campus Crossroads project, and what, what do we think will be the opportunities at the end of the road for Notre Dame if we overcome these challenges? I confess I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by the, the last of the two, but all too quickly, if you can, just explain a little bit more about what you mean at the end of the road, what kinds of opportunities, what do you have in mind, or what's the question? Just like... Um I think most importantly to be um, a bastion of the, the Catholic religion. Okay. Bastion of the Catholic religion. Okay. Well, I I think the crossroads thing is a mistake. Um, it's not worth four hundred million dollars, uh, and I myself think it's a, a kind of um, not monstrosity. That's too strong. I think. Uh, but it's really the, the wrong kind of signal, I think, to send to our students and to our constituents and the stakeholders. Um, I personally don't see it as anything other than a, a kind of um, carnival surrounding luxury accommodations for football fans. Um, I'm old-fashioned. Um, if you, you want to watch football, you'll have to sit outside with the rest of us. Um, and that's just the way it's going to have to be. So I'm against the Crossroads Project. I don't think it indicates good stewardship. I think it indicates a kind of see me affluence at work, and I, and I just think it's unfortunate. Um, so what's at the end of the, the road, I, I, don't, I don't think I could say anything particularly insightful in terms of what's likely to happen, or where we'll probably find ourselves in 10 years or 20 years. So all I can do is fall back upon what is an unimaginative bromide, uh, I guess, of, for, for Catholics, which is, you know, it, it is just our task to do what's right and take one step and put the foot in front of that one and take the next step, really just to discern our institutional vocation, you know, that path that's put in front of us by Jesus, what Jesus wants us to do as a, as a group, each of us individually, but of course we're talking about us as individuals collaborating in this thing called Notre Dame, so we're all called as that group, that Notre Dame community, uh, to be faithful to Jesus and to just do what Jesus calls us to do. And I'm old-fashioned enough to believe in providence. That is to say, providence, not the college of Dominican place in Rhode Island, but rather providence, meaning that we, we can't see how it works for the better. Uh, I don't know how it will work for the better, but I trust that you know, God will draw out of our successes and our failures uh, something good. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would just uh, echo my concerns uh, about the Crossroads Project. It's not my decision to make, obviously. I personally wasn't consulted, I don't think many of us here were. Uh, uh, the, to use contemporary language, the optics seem really bad to me, among other things. Uh, you know, Notre Dame is now, like a lot of schools, charging, it, tell me, $50,000 a year. For, uh, you want to touch. Uh, Next year, 59600 Next year. I'm not paying it. And change. <laughs> so $60,000 a year uh, for his tuition, and then uh, putting up a palace around our, um, our football stadium. I, you know, it, it attached, I, I taught my first freshman seminar last, uh, last semester, and what struck me was the really tight linking uh, in students' minds between the amount of money that they, or more likely their parents, were paying, and their felt sense that their major had to be practical, and likely in the business school, in order for them to justify their parents making that kind of sacrifice. So what we're, what we're really telling our students is that by expecting you to pay this you know, really magnificent amount of money, uh, you are the kind of person you're going to be, the kind of vocation you're going to have is going to be largely driven by the fact that your parents are likely going to be entering into a substantial amount of debt or uh, having to arrange all kinds of uh, financial uh, uh, situations to make, that, to make that possible. So it seems to me that uh, we should be thinking a lot more about are we making it possible for our students to 
pursue their, their vocation in ways that they can do so, um, un, perhaps less influenced by, among other things, we talk about the demands of the world, by the need to make X number of dollars when they, when they graduate uh, in order to, um, whether, whether, they, whether they feel pressure or not from their parents, um, the internal pressure they feel in many ways, they're already getting enormous pressure from the world. Um, so I, I think that uh, those optics are, are really problematic. It seems to me that, that um, we have a center of campus, um, uh, and we have, uh, we have buildings there that, that probably could be nicely renovated in ways that we've done that would cost a fraction of the cost of, of the proposed project that could provide some very nice facilities for additional student, uh, student life, uh, a, a renovated student center. Uh, some additional spaces will be made uh, available for other departments. So I'm wondering what the problem is that's being solved by this particular uh, proposal, and I can't but help but conclude that it really does ultimately relate to this carnival uh, atmosphere around the football stadium. I, I don't want to impute motives, but it's, it seems to me there's a, there's a much less expensive way to solve a particular set of problems that it purports to be solved. I'm Tiernan Kane. I'm in my first year in the political science department here. I want to thank uh, Marcy Anna for the um, excellent event and our speakers for giving us their time here tonight. My question is just um, if you have specific advice to students on, um, you know, you've talked a lot about various problems that are facing Notre Dame. Would you say that there are certain projects uh, that could really use their attention and organization and activity? Would you say, you know, let a, a thousand flowers bloom? Or are some projects really primed for student um, effect or some? Project's really something that you just do a waste of energy for students to try to focus on. Well, I, I, I guess the one thing that struck me so far is that, um, and I, I'll speak perhaps a little bit narrowly in the sense that I'm particularly, I've been, had a lot of, I've been very gratified having come here uh, and having been invited to speak to a lot of campus groups, particularly those who are interested in Catholic things, Catholic issues. And there's a lot of fragmentation, it seems to me. We talk a lot about integration, but there's a lot of fragmentation where certain student groups don't know what other student groups are doing. So the, the very challenge that we faculty face, which is disintegration, it seems in a lot of ways defines undergraduate life. And I suppose that's just part of the nature of the piece that, that there's disintegration. But uh, you know, there's a group that's concerned with pro-life issues. There's a group that's concerned with family issues. Ron Sinkbeck and this uh, faculty advisor for that group. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a plethora of groups that are doing different things, and yet they don't always know what, what they're all doing. And it seems to me that uh, if indeed these kinds of issues, as I think they are, all, are ultimately integrated, and I'd like to think also the economic part of it, what, what is it we're going to do as a, for a living, how is that going to relate to our lives as members of, as parents, as parts of the family, as parts of the community, as parts of the neighborhoods, as, as citizens, then it would be wonderful to see uh, greater integration uh, across already existing kinds of projects uh, that uh, uh, at, at this moment seems like it's, it's a bit fragmented. But it's probably built into the nature of modern university. People are often busy. Um, but, uh, but it seems to me that, that a bit more, if we faculty need to be a bit, more, a bit more conscious about integrating what we're doing in our classrooms with each other uh, and with our students coming out for events like this, Students should also be thinking about this, that, that there's a need for integration on our, on our campuses as well. Yeah, um, I would say that the, the challenge for the focus as, as much, maybe even, well, not more, but as much for the students as for the faculty, I would say. Um, and it may actually be good for, for faculty if students uh, invite them to reflect on how the particular discipline or course that they're teaching could be integrated with the Catholic day for the Catholic teachers. Um, ask them. Eduardo, I saw your hand as well. Thanks. So I'd like to address the, um, the HHS mandate that's cool with everyone um, and the school's compliance with it. I spoke to Father Jenkins last week at a town hall meeting that he offered um, in which I essentially asked what was the school's rationale for complying with the mandate when it had been pretty clear that Notre Dame had said compliance would be impossible um, and that the USCCB have been very unanimous in saying that the mandate as it stands is in clear violations of Catholic conscience, even with the third party exemption. 
uh, that the o Obama administration has provided. Uh, so I'd like to hear perhaps from each of you kind of just frank thoughts on um, the school's compliance. Uh, Father Jenkins said it was a prudential decision uh, to comply, that there's a place for uh, civil disobedience, uh, but that nevertheless the current situation, um, because there was not formal material compliance in providing um, the services with the school, that, you know, frankly Notre Dame doesn't want to bleed a million dollars a day in penalties, and that the situation uh, calls for fighting in, in the courts, as we're doing, but complying in the meantime. So, if anyone want to comment on the school's course of action there? Here from the law school. <laughs> well, I agree. It's, it's, it's not a matter of formal cooperation and evil. Um, but I, I, I think that there's um, the caveat that goes with that. Um, is that sometimes when people say, and I, I'm not now attributing this thought to Father Jenkins, I don't, I don't know what he said exactly, but, but he's quite right if he said that it's not formal cooperation. But, but sometimes when people say that, and perhaps even when they say, well, then it's prudential, they actually seem to think, well, then there's no right answer, and, and, and you can kind of do what, well, whatever you think is fine. Now, I think that's a mistake. That is to say that there is material cooperation of a certain kind here, and the considerations that go into whether material cooperation is of the permissible type or an impermissible type can be quite rigorous. And it can really be a right answer and a wrong answer. And it's not a matter of, well, you have a material cooperation, it's sort of whatever your best guess is. Uh, I don't think that's the case at all. Again, I'm not attributing this thought to Father Jenkins, but I just would say that in this case, um, there's a very serious question of material cooperation, which I think goes well beyond the more ticky-tacky or tiny act that's the subject of a lawsuit which is literally taking a federal form, downloading a federal form, and filling in about three lines of it, which certifies that we're objecting to the contraception coverage, and then not sending that to the government, which doesn't require it be sent to the government, and the government doesn't want it. Just have it on file and send it to your third-party administrator of insurance. Now, if you look at that only, it looks like it's almost inconsequential. Nonetheless, 18, I think, of 19 religious plaintiffs, like us, have gotten relief in court. We're the outlier. We're the only one that hasn't gotten the relief they sought. But beyond that, I think that a, a better look at what's involved in this case really does require a broader look at the place of the mandate in Obamacare and the place of all of that in the society. So to sort of try to wrap this point up into one thing, I would not so sharply, I would not sharply distinguish trying to avoid immoral cooperation with the mandate from civil disobedience. I think what is at stake in the mandate as a matter of Notre Dame's vocation or calling, what Notre Dame should do, what the limits of its material cooperation are, has precisely to do with the state of our society what the mandate represents, and the coming winter, uh, certainly be one of our discontent, that the mandate pretends. Those considerations, wider they may be, and taking into account not just whether Notre Dame can avoid immorality, uh, these considerations take into account Notre Dame's entire responsibility as a participant in American culture. And I think when that broader horizon is opened up, and I do mean to say that's part of what it means to consider what are our moral responsibilities. So just for example, it could be, could be, I'm not saying it is, but it could be Notre Dame's moral responsibility to push back, to really test the limits of the law. And that's not to be seen as, well, that would be civil disobedience and that's not what we're going to do. That's part of what a conscientious response to the mandate includes. Um, I think it's a great concern. Um, I think Notre Dame also has a teaching responsibility. Um, why is Notre Dame exactly opposed to the HHS mandate? Um, we got an invitation to, uh, in the mail as a faculty, and we're, we're very grateful participants in the, in the medical um, insurance that the, that the university very generously provides. But 
it came as an offer to us to get you know all these all these uh, services that the church has um, from time immemorial declared to be morally deficient that the catechism has stated um, if you know what you're doing is a, is a, is a moral sin um, and just send that to faculty or anyone participating in the, in the insurance program without any explanation, any sense that this is not a system of Catholic teaching, I thought was strange and a missed teaching opportunity. If we are Catholics and we really believe that this hurts you, you don't want to give it to people. Right? I mean, that, that's the really basic, in my mind, the really basic point here. We're being forced or no, they are being forced by the government to provide things, even very remotely and directly, that we are convinced hurt you. And so you don't want to help in any way, shape or form um, to, to hurt others or um, to facilitate that they do so. I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know what, you know, but I, I, I do agree that I'm wondering if more could, could have been done, I don't know. Um, I think more could have been said, more explanation uh, could, have been, uh, could have been offered. Um, the, um, and I, I got the sense from the judge's decision that the judge partly decided how he decided to do the three Dutch panel, two judges who decided to not grant Notre Dame relief is what I think the judges saw as um, a lack of clarity and, and enthusiasm on the university's part. Um, and that I see that same uh, that lack of clarity um, in, in, in the response. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I agree with everything that's been said up here. I don't want to just repeat that, but it, but it seems to me that uh, also worth just reflecting uh, the way which uh, this particular issue and how Notre Dame responds to this particular issue uh, is not is going to be indicative of uh, how it or the kinds of ways that it will be forced to respond to an increasing number of challenges that we're likely to see that will touch very deeply on whether or not this institution can be true to that missionary discipleship. This will not be the the last challenge that I think Notre Dame will be receiving from an increasingly uh, aggressive secular, not only just government, but society that views the beliefs uh, and positions of the Catholic Church as anathema and increasingly unacceptable in uh, contemporary American society. Uh, and so I, I, I understand the desire not to pay a million dollars a day fund. I, sympathetic with that. But at the same time, we're going to be faced with some challenges about whether or not we will continue to be a viable institution, it seems to me. Uh, and uh, this may involve questions about, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about seven steps down the road, perhaps, or maybe just two, or even closer. But the tax-exempt status of uh, may come into question in the not too distant future. What are we going to do then? Are we going to let those financial considerations drive us to make compromises? I, mean, I realize that those issues are going to have to be dealt with separately. But it seems to me that if we're not willing to say that for the witness of our faith, we're going to have to make some decisions that are going to be financially deleterious. And maybe we say, okay, we can't put up a four hundred million dollar stadium because we're we're going to have to uh, face some, you know, at least until we get relief, uh, which I hope we do receive, of course, uh, that we may be forced to uh, uh, bank some of this some of this cash. Um, but, uh, but it seems to me that how we act now is in many ways going to be um, at least indicative, or at least I hope um, will be done so in a way that is aware of the ways that I think we're going to be uh, continuously, uh, and perhaps even more deeply challenged as we go forward with, with, with a number of these issues in the future. So my name is Mark Gaijin Paula. I'm a junior finance major. Um, so my question, I guess, is specifically about the required curriculum here, and I guess uh, applicable to Mendoza specifically, uh, but also in the arts. So I know, you know the university requires two required theology classes, one being mandatory, that's the foundation of theology, which is basically church history. And the 
the second is kind of you know, up to you. Um, I guess for Professor Lee and you know, the greater I guess, scheme of the university, how do you see the, you know, the first required theology being church history? Uh, do you see that as, as a good step? Or you know, I would think you have kind of a better opportunity to reach people who may be taking their first theology course. Uh, and then in the business school specifically, can we take the, the required ethics course? Uh, but do you see there to be a greater opportunity in maybe requiring a course such as yours uh, having to do with corporate governance and, and CST, uh, or possibly, uh, I don't know, Professor Atusa teaches the morality of capitalism course, uh, something more similar to that, uh, where you can bring that Catholic identity as well into, into business. Uh, well, actually, there was at some point I, I, I hoped to talk a little bit about curriculum, uh, just as a, uh, one, of the, one of the major aspects of what seems to me is a distinctive part of the Catholic institution. I don't want to go on too much length about that, but um, and you asked me some very specific questions, and here my relative newness here uh, doesn't let me speak with a lot of uh, specific knowledge about, about those. Uh, but it, it, it seems to me that um, one of the things that Professor Bradley was saying about the need of faculty to in some ways integrate their understanding of the faith, their, uh, their deep engagement with the faith in their classes, means that in some ways, ideally, all of us are involving theology and philosophy in all of our classes, in all of the various ways that, that can be done in all of the various disciplines. So that in the first instance, I, I, I believe and I support that one should have to take courses in theology and philosophy. But these should not be viewed as, in some ways, discrete or separate from what one should be receiving throughout one's curriculum. And if students approach this, and if their experience of these requirements is, okay, now I'm doing my theology, I'm done with that, check that out, and now I'm done with my philosophy, check that out, then you have not received a Catholic education. Those, those topics in particular, as Cardinal Newman uh, so beautifully writes in his, uh, his great masterpiece, The Idea of the University, should be integrated throughout curriculum, should be appearing and reappearing throughout the curriculum. Uh, so, on the one hand, I think that uh, the offerings in the theology and philosophy departments for our undergraduates in those, in those required areas should be some of the most powerful courses that they take, should be transformative, and that these departments all have a special duty, a special obligation to make sure their best teachers are in those classes, uh, that they're hiring faculty to teach those classes. Right? Maybe this is where you have, may have to make a compromise. We're not going to get the, the brightest, biggest name in philosophy and theology, and we're going to get faculty to teach those classes really well, because these are the uh, these are foundational courses. But also that these the themes of these courses and the content of these courses should be continuous throughout one's curriculum. And if that's not happening, then what we have there is disintegration. You, you have theology being over here treated over here, philosophy being treated over there. Uh, this is where having a, not just a Catholic in name or Catholic in number, but Catholic or Catholic, Catholic sympathetic faculty that's integrating these disciplines in all of their courses uh, will ultimately create a kind of resonance and overlap that should be you know, profoundly um, exciting and enlightening and engaging for students. Not just I'm taking a random set of classes, but every class, every semester, is somehow fitting together. And when you get that once in a while, it should be something really exciting to you. Wow, my English class and my theology class and my biology class are all kind of working together this semester. That shouldn't just be an accident at an institution like that. That should be the default. So A, yes, good classes in philosophy and theology, but B, not limited to those disciplines. Yeah, very well said. Um, I think the theme is integration, right? And so these these courses should also be integrated with the curriculum after that. Um, it's hard to do the integration as a faculty if you have no idea what your students actually know about the Catholic social teachings for my in my in my in my class, right? Um, because all of these required courses are all different, right? It, it, it makes it much harder, I think. Um, there's a trade up there. How much choice do you want to give versus to what extent do you want to have all students have to say? In my mind, it would be extremely useful, right, for my very narrow purposes. Um, if all students have an intent to be a business major, we would take a specific set of um, theology and, and, and 
philosophy class that really um, sets them up to really read the Catholic social teaching documents. Um, so courses that, that, that deal with the, the dignity of human person, solidarity and subsidiarity, what those things mean, the, the theological and philosophical aspects of the human person. And then in the, in the finance marketing the class, if you can build on that, I don't think that currently we have such a foundation uh, in those classes to build on. And it's not clear to me how much, well I should ask you really, uh, I haven't taken the class myself, just looked at the syllabi, it's not clear how much um, real Catholic content there is in all of these different versions of those applied courses. We have time for one more, one more question and a brief answer from whoever it's addressed to. Good evening, I'm Daniel Mark. Um, I thought that uh, Professor Bradley's comment at the end about the need for the university uh, to cultivate a kind of indifference uh, in order to be a leading witnessing machine uh, brought us full circle uh, to what Professor Denise said at the beginning about the tension inherent in mis missionary discipleship because uh, discipleship sometimes means believing and saying unpopular things while being a missionary requires saying to the world and being engaged. Um, but I also noticed that uh, Pope, Fran Pope Francis' supporters, um, both inside and outside the church, seem to be uh, seem to put a lot of focus on the fact that Pope Francis takes an approach or a tone or whatever you want to call it that seems to be much more popular, uh, shall we say? It, uh, it seems you know a, a message that's more palatable, more easily received. Um, so, uh, I, I'm, from one perspective, and I'm of course very sympathetic to this, is that Pope Francis is teaching us how to love better. Has, how to speak to the world uh, in a way that, that the world can hear. But I wonder if there's another sentence of the question is, 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 uh, is uh, Pope Francis's example um, a, make it uh, uh, easier or more difficult um, for the church, for, for the university to strike this posture of missionary discipleship, uh, which requires going out and saying things that won't be popular and may even be hated? Is it? Is, it, is his example pushing the church, church toward that mission or deterring it from that mission? No, it's, it's an excellent question, uh, Danielle. Um, and I think I understand what the question is and appreciate its force. And I think it's, I can't tell. Um, I mean, Pope Francis' papacy is still so, you know, so underdeveloped. Um, it's hard to say what, what it will really look like and what its major effects will be before long. I mean, you're absolutely right that people are attracted to him in a way that they weren't attracted to Benedict, obviously. Maybe they were attracted to J.P. too when he was a much younger man, um, you know, early in his papacy. Uh, but nonetheless, I think there, there is something going on that I can't quite wrap my mind around. And I think the, the heart of any adequate answer to your question would require some confidence in one's knowledge of what Francis is up to. And, and I lack that confidence. It's not that I find everything he says ambiguous, or, or even most of what he says ambiguous, uh, but it seems to me there are just conflicting signals. Um, so, Walter, briefly, what do I mean by that? Um, well, if the force of your question is the same, does Pope Francis himself seem to be desiring popularity, if you will, or a kind of acceptance himself? Now, I think yes and no. Uh, he seems possessed of the conviction that there are many things the church has been doing uh, which have gotten in the way of presenting the gospel to people effectively, and Jesus to the people. And he says things that I think are a mix of accurate and inaccurate, or exaggerated and not quite so exaggerated, about parish life, about doctrine, about moral teaching, about various aspects of the institutional church. And I think what he says there which is not a matter of teaching, and it really, Catholics are free to disagree with what he says because they're observations of fact. I would disagree with quite, quite a lot of what he says. But nonetheless, he, these are examples at hand of what I take to be his central, one of his central ideas, which is a lot of what we've been doing has been impeding evangelization rather than promoting it. Uh, now that's not the same thing as saying he, he's sort of hankering to be accepted or popular. Uh, but I think that nonetheless, just that idea that we have been impeding evangelization and the way I think he's saying that we can promote a real evangelization is by sort of convincing people, you know, that, that Jesus loves you 
And then when you realize that, you'll be a lot happier. I, I think that's sort of true and sort of not. I think Jesus really does love us, uh, but of course, there's the cross, and there's repentance, and there is the real prospect of hell as well as heaven. And I think there's an element of utopianism in Francis's outlook. Not all the time, but some of the time he seems to think that there's a kind of imminent tendency within the world for justice and righteousness in a way that I think is naive, if I'm just mistaken. Um, so that's, that's, my answer is I, I can't really say what he's up to, but I do think that as Patrick has said, as I guess we've all said, um, Notre Dame will indeed have to cultivate a kind of acceptance of unpopularity and criticism, I think to an extent much beyond that it presently seems to possess, frankly. Uh, if it's going to do what it has to do, and what I think Francis is calling it to do. Yeah, I, I, I was struck by, the, uh, by Francis's uh, exhortation to Notre Dame, which of course got a certain amount of play around our campus, but I don't think it was widely discussed. It seems to me that if you read, uh, and you, this, I mean, his exhortation to or his comments to Notre Dame, that on his annual, if you read many of the things that he says that go without any comment in the broader culture, uh, there's there's very little in those in, in most of those comments that would excite most of today's popular culture in a sense or the broader culture. Uh, there are a couple of statements that he's made that have gotten people very excited. Uh, and it seems to me there's, there's a, almost a kind of willful desire to read into some of those statements uh, that here we are on the verge of seeing a transformation of churches completely changing the teachings of the last 2,000 plus years. It seems to me that, that everything that he said, maybe the tone has been slightly different from time to time, but there's been everything he said, enough, nothing that he has said has changed the teachings of the church. Uh, and everything he's just said uh, has been in conformity with those teachings. And my, most of what he has said, including the, uh, his remarks to Notre Dame, has been the kind of thing you would expect in many ways Benedict to have said or John Paul II to have said, very much in keeping with those, uh, with those kinds of statements. The call to be missionary disciples, uh, to be true uh, to oneself, to, to bear uncompromising witness. That's a, that's a pretty stern call to a place like Notre Dame. Um, so I, 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 I appreciate your, your question, but, but it seems to me that um, in many ways, um, for people, I think, who see themselves as a bit more on the conservative side of contemporary Catholicism, Francis is a reminder that Catholicism is always going to be more than merely a party affiliation. Uh, that Catholicism is always going to, in some ways, not fit well into the way we divide up the political world, however that may be in our contemporary society. And to the extent that he's made some of us uncomfortable. That may not be a bad thing. Uh, we, got, we tend to get pretty comfortable under John Paul II and Benedict XVI. Um, and that's not a bad thing because we should be a bit uncomfortable uh, when we think about our place in contemporary society. Um, so I, I, I think in part, it's a, it's whether intended or not, I don't, I don't think it's intended really necessarily for an American audience per se, uh, but it's a helpful reminder uh, that, that the witness we have to bear is going to be a, unpopular and sometimes going to challenge us in ways that are going to push us outside of our comfort zone, even those of us who feel that we're doing our best to bear that missionary discipleship and that witness in the world. And, and, I, and I think that's been something, sometimes a challenging thing, but also in some respects a helpful thing. Um, I see, like, like Patrick, I see great continuity in, in the Pope's teachings but a different pastoral approach. Um, and um, he generates so much enthusiasm that I hope will then lead to people to actually study um, the actual teachings of, of the church, and to read, uh, read the whole uh, document, uh, all the Joy of the Gospel documents, rather than just isolated phrases. And if he's able to do that, I think that would be a tremendous blessing. Um, I think the pastoral approach, um, I'm, I, I think, is um, I'm very much inclined to believe that he, um, that I know nothing about that, and, uh, and he, he is um, 
the master here. Um, and I think he, he invites us Catholics to, um, to get to know the other person, whoever that other person is, get to know that other person, uh, as that other person is, not how we would like that other person to be. Whether that's a poor person, whether that's a person with an anti-Catholic view, whether it's a person who is Catholic but in a different way than us, first get to know that person and really uh, engage in a conversation with the person, try to know the person, love the person, and, and then serve the person. And in that friendship, um, be a missionary to someone. On behalf of the Father Ron Bierle and the Divorce Center, thank you all for being here tonight. Please join me again in welcoming. Thank you, our, our speakers, for their time this evening.